We continue in our exposition of the gospel according to St. Luke, the study of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. We learned last week that Jesus told the Pharisees that the kingdom of God doesn't come at all accompanied with observation. Like with, you know, people standing and watching a procession, watching the grand spectacle of the arrival of the new kingdom. It's not like that, Jesus said to the Pharisees. It's not at all a kingdom like the Romans would parade their general who had just conquered a nation. That's what Jesus told the Pharisees. It's not like that. You can't observe it in that manner. But then, Jesus turns to the disciples and discuss the arrival of the kingdom of God. You'll find that here. He discussed it with them, and it seems to me that he told them that the kingdom of God will be very much observable. And looking at the original language of verse 22 here, in Luke 17, a Bible scholar by the name of Linsky, he surmised that the Pharisees had left, or Jesus perhaps now had turned to the disciples and proceeded on their journey. The Pharisees needed to be told that the kingdom is inside, it's within. It's within their grasp, unobservable, spiritual. Therefore, it is unseen. But then the Lord adds, for the sake of his disciples, that after the spiritual work of this kingdom is done, it will be observable and it will be sudden. It will come suddenly like Lightning in judgment on the world, end quote. When I was studying this, it was almost as if Christ was saying one thing to one group of people and then another thing, another thing to another group of people. It seemed to me that he was saying the kingdom of God is unobservable to the Pharisees. And then, it is, un, it is observable, as he was talking to the Jews, the, the disciples. Now, when you read this and you think that, then you're not alone. Because Jesus did speak one way to one group, and then another way to another group. But, let's be careful here and state that that is not to say that he is deceiving one group, that he is lying to people. Of course not. He has a purpose for doing that. Why? Because he knows who those who would reject him, right? And he knows who those who would receive him. And that's why you see this language, the kingdom of God is unobservable. The kingdom of God, you will see it suddenly coming. What you'll find here in this text is a fascinating discussion by Jesus on the subject of the coming of the kingdom of God on earth. And so, let me give you a couple of words that will help us all understand better what the kingdom of God is really like. The first word is spiritual. Okay, if you're Writing things down, write that word spiritual. There's that sense of being unobserved, unseen, because it is spiritual. And the second word is suddenly. Suddenly. The first word, spiritual, was meant to correct the Pharisees' wrongheadedness in their assumption of a militant Messiah. They were looking for a general. 
They were looking for a military great general. And the second word, suddenly, was meant to alert the disciples to the signs of the coming of God's kingdom physically on earth. In the first key word that I gave you, spiritual, the Lord sought to correct their wrong thinking. Somebody said, the Pharisees believed that the Messiah's triumph would be immediate. They were looking for him to come, overthrow Rome, and set up the millennial kingdom. Christ's program was altogether different. He was, in his first coming, inaugurating an era in which the kingdom would be manifest in the rule of God in people's hearts through faith in the Savior, end quote. And so that kind of kingdom was, and that kind of kingdom is spiritual. It comes quietly, not with an, not, not with an illustrious parade. It comes like the wind blows, unobservable. Have you ever seen the wind? Because it comes to the hearts of men first. You remember Nicodemus. How many of you remember Nico? Raise your hand. Nicodemus, one of the more favorable Pharisees uh, who came to Jesus by night and asked questions about the kingdom of God. You will recall that Nicodemus was told by Jesus that the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Jesus told him, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. On the other hand, the kingdom of God does come physically, and it will come on earth. And what's the second key word that I gave you? Suddenly. Suddenly. So please stand, if you're able to, for the reading of God's holy and authoritative word this morning in Luke 17, beginning in verse 22, all the way to verse 30. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here or see there. Go not after them, Jesus says, nor follow them. Verse 24, For as the lightning that lighteth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came suddenly and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But, the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Thus far is the reading of God's holy and authoritative word. May it be a blessing in our consciences in our hearts in our minds this morning may the Holy Spirit convince you and correct your thinking where it is needed and or comfort you where you need to be encouraged you may be seated
Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your holy and authoritative word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, today for your work of convincing, persuading, prompting, correcting, comforting, encouraging. We thank you, Jesus, for your discussion on the coming of the kingdom of God to alert and awaken your disciples to prepare ourselves and our children and our children's children. Grant that we may be edified today by the explanation of your word, by your holy and humble servant in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to look at a few truths here from this text. Number one, the days of longing for the day of the Son of Man implies tribulation. The days of longing imply tribulation. We get that right out of verse 22. But Jesus says, although you long for a day, even just one day of the Son of Man in His kingdom, even if you long for it, it's not going to come. You will not see it. Even if you're, you're longing for even just a day in the kingdom of God, which is a good desire, right? It's not going to usher the kingdom of God, Jesus says. In other words, God is not going to set up His kingdom on earth just because you wanted it to come. He's not on your schedule, Baba. <laughs> now, as I've said, it's not bad to long for the day of the Son of Man to come. Of course not, it's not. But what is necessary is that the spiritual work of the kingdom of God, listen, must be totally done first. Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew tells us, and the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. If you're interested in this, you can do a research, a study, on how many tribes and languages and nations today still do not have a copy of God's word in their language. There's so many still. And that's why we continue to support the Wycliffe Bible translators as it has been their mission to translate the Word of God in thousands of dialects and languages still. And so I think that the proper response to our longing for a day of the Son of Man is what? What is the proper response when you or I wake up one day and you long for the kingdom of God? You're looking at your home situation. You're looking at the political landscape of our land and you say, oh, may God's kingdom come now, 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 now. What is the proper response? It's simply this. We need to be active in advancing the kingdom of God. Amen? We need to be more active in advancing the kingdom of God because the spiritual work of the kingdom of God must be totally done first. To get active in the spiritual work one Bible interpreter said, the visible, glorious consummation of the kingdom must wait in total until the spiritual work has been completed. So the days of longing imply tribulation. And so Jesus predicted here that the disciples, those his original audience, as well as you and I today, who are disciples of Jesus Christ, that we will long for the day of the Son of Man because there will be tribulations. 
And this is in keeping with what Jesus Christ promised in the book of John. He says that in the world ye shall have what? Tribulations. But cheer up, I have overcome the world. Point number two. Don't be deceived when people say the Son of Man is here or there. Why? Because everybody will know it. And here's the second key word that I gave you. Everybody will know it suddenly. Where is that? That's in verses 23 and 24. Somebody wrote, In the glory of the final consummation and manifestation of the kingship of Christ, when the veil will be removed from his identity and every eye shall behold his glory as the king of kings, we will not need a CNN briefing. We will not need a press report. Why? He explained it here. The lightning will light up the whole sky and everybody can see it. The blaze of glory that will attend his return will be so great that not even the Pharisees nor their sons and children of the Pharisees will be able to miss it, end quote. Not even the worshipers of Antichrist will miss it. They will see the coming of the King of Kings to set up his kingdom. Number three. In verse 25, we're given the reason why the kingdom of God wasn't physically established yet when Christ came here on earth, his first coming. And the reason for this is what? He said that he must suffer first. Can you get any clearer than this? Verse 25, look at that. But first must he suffer first many things and be rejected of this generation. Wow. The reason why the kingdom of God was not physically established yet was because Christ's first coming was to suffer first for the sins of his people. His first coming was to lay the groundwork, the foundation for his earthly governance. His second coming will be the actual establishment of a physical, godly kingdom. One pastor said, Therefore we are living between the already and the not yet, which explains why we are still praying for God's kingdom to come and why sometimes we wonder when our prayers will ever be answered. In Christ's first coming, the Son of Man, He Himself, must suffer many things and be rejected of that generation. In His first coming, the prophecies of Isaiah 53 must first be fulfilled. I want you to turn to Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, because I want to show you from Scripture what prophecies these were to which Jesus points where the Pharisees totally missed, totally missed it. Many, many Jews even today think that they are as a nation, they are the suffering servant mentioned here in this prophecy, but they are mistaken. And one day, one day they will be convinced Many, many Jews will be convinced that this was indeed Jesus Christ, the chosen one of God, their Messiah. But let's read it just so you know where it's at in the Scripture and you see with your eyes. Now let me, let me remind you that this was written some 700 years prior to Jesus' earthly ministry. Can you fathom that? But every single one of these verses was fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Let's read it together. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? 
For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form, nor comeliness. He wasn't handsome. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, as we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, Will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Every single verse of that chapter was fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. And in his first coming, he came as a suffering servant. As he said here to his disciples, and by extension to you and me, that he must first suffer in Christ's second coming. Notice this. He will come as a conquering general. In his second coming, he will come not as a child in a manger, but as king of the world. The Apostle John says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many crowns, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed, not in a swaddling clothes, but in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of wrath of God the Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you're writing things down, that's Revelation 19, 11 and following. Revelation 19, 11 and following. But in the meantime, as we wait for that second coming, 
Jesus told his disciples, and again, by extension, you and me today, that number four, the days of the Son of Man are just as it was in the days of Noah. Where do we find that? In our text, Luke 17, verses 26 and 27. What were the days of Noah like? Ironically, there were over a hundred years that Noah preached righteousness. He preached warning. One hundred and twenty years. He warned people. But when the floods came, they came suddenly. When the floods came, the people were surprised to see it come. How could you be surprised when Noah had been preaching about the coming judgment for 120 years? Perhaps the long time waiting for the first drop of rain, it fed their doubts. But ultimately, they did not believe the words that were preached by the servant of the living God. According to Jesus Christ, let me ask you a question. What were they doing during the days of Noah? Jesus simply says here that they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying. What? What were these activities? What were these things? What, what were these actions? What, what are they? They're just ordinary things. They're ordinary activities that people do. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, sleep, work, go to school, graduate from high school, go to college, graduate from college. They find somebody they like and they marry them. Ordinary activities. They are normal things that people did in the days of Noah. They are normal things that you and I do today. Jesus simply describes the usual round of life's activities. People thought that all things would continue as they had seen for hundreds of years continue. And they were wrong. Judgment came. What's the second word? Suddenly. Suddenly. Judgment came suddenly. There was, no, there was no time to prepare. It was too late. The flood came and destroyed them all. And so Jesus gives a second illustration now, verses 28 through 30. The day when the Son of Man is revealed is just as it was in the days of Lot. Now in this example, when Jesus gave this as we now read it, because we have a record of Genesis 18, right? Where the debauchery of Sodom and Gomorrah is recorded for us. When we, when we read this, knowing Genesis 18, we immediately think of the horrendous homosexual debauchery for which Sodom and Gomorrah was famous or infamous. But, but, but I don't think that this was Jesus' point. That's not his point. It's not so much the evil and the wickedness which Jesus was meaning to convey as signs and precursor to the second coming of the Son of Man. Where again, you have eating and drinking and buying and selling, and planting, and building. Did Jesus mention any of the homosexual society and debauchery in the days of Lot? 
nothing. And therefore, what he was conveying was this, that people do ordinary things, normal things, drinking, buying, selling, eating, planting, building, ordinary activities that people do, and all of a sudden, judgment caught them totally by surprise, for they lived as though it would never come. As in the days of Lot, fire and sulfur came to Sodom. Obviously, different judgment from Noah's day, but judgment nonetheless. And the similarities which Jesus conveyed were that these judgment, and his point is this, judgment comes what? What's that key word that I gave you? Suddenly. Suddenly and totally. That is, in both of these events, in the days of Noah, in the days of Lot, there were total destruction. And so, hear the words of Jesus. Luke 17, 30. He says what? Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Meaning what? We'll be doing ordinary things. We go to our coffee table, at least I do every morning, right? Grind my coffee beans from Central America. Very special. <laughs> Sometimes one of my kiddos would cook eggs over medium for me. <laughs> ordinary things that we do. Lunch, dinner, gather the kids together for Bible reading and prayer before they go to bed. Go to bed, wake up in the morning, do the same thing over and over and over again. And all of a sudden, Judgment comes. The second coming of Jesus Christ is here. And those who reject him are brought to judgment. That's what the coming of Jesus is like according to himself. So let me give you some applications this morning. First, let's Get active in advancing the kingdom of God. Let's get more active in the spiritual work. This is an application for those of you who already believe that the first coming of Jesus Christ was that he suffered for your sins and laid the groundwork there, the foundational work for the setting up of the kingdom of God in the second coming of the Son of Man. This is your application. This is my application. Let us prepare ourselves for the end times by what? Sharing the gospel that exonerates us from coming of the wrath of God, from God's coming wrath. This month, this missions pickup month is designed to remind us of our obligation to share the gospel. I was deeply, deeply encouraged uh, to see several of you here yesterday as we went out into our neighborhoods and gave out gospel outlines as a practical application of what we are now hearing from Jesus Christ. Let us prepare for the end times by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're praying that the Lord will bless our efforts, that the people who received the gospel outlines will actually read those words and the Holy Spirit using those words to convince them of sin and to challenge them to repent of their sins and believe the gospel. Secondly, let us not miss the urgency to which Jesus conveyed a theologian said, we must not miss the note of earnestness and urgency in Jesus' words as he points 
to a future crisis and pleads with people to be ready when the Son of Man appears. End quote. Are you a believer today? Are you a believer in Jesus today? Perhaps you're not convinced or you are already convinced that He is the King of the Kingdom of God. But perhaps you're not convinced that you can do anything now because I'm still young, Brother Christian. I'll wait till I'm in high school. I'll wait till I'm in college. I'll wait till I'm married. I'll wait till I'm retired. I'll wait till I'm done with vacation. I say to you, don't. Because you're not guaranteed of tomorrow, are you? Don't wait till it's too late. The time to prepare to get more active in advancing the kingdom of God is now. You say, well, Christian, I'm retired now. I'm now old, or should I say mature in age. There's nothing I can do to advance the kingdom of God now that I'm retired. May I humbly correct you this morning? You may be right that you're retired or mature in age, but there are a thousand items that you can do for the Lord now. Amen. Oh, may the Holy Spirit convince you that there are a lot of things that you can do to advance the kingdom of God. One example I give to you is, is this, what I call writing letters of evangelism. Let me show you from our history. Ronald Reagan. You know Ronald Reagan, right? Okay. When his father-in-law was dying in the hospital, the president wrote to him a gospel presentation. Did you know that? He said, and he called his name. His name is Loyal. Great name. But he was an atheist. He was an agnostic. He was a doctor of some sorts, a scientist. He says to him with his own penmanship, I know your feeling, your doubt, but could I just impose on you a little longer? He said, 700 years before the birth of Christ, the ancient prophet, prophets predicted the coming of the Messiah. They said he would be born in a lowly place, would proclaim himself the Son of God, and would be put to death for saying that. All in all, there were a total of 123 specific prophecies about his life, all of which came true. Reagan said, Crucifixion was unknown in those times, yet it was foretold that he would be nailed to a cross of wood. And one of the predictions was that he would be born of a virgin. Now, I know that is probably the hardest for you as a doctor to accept. The only answer that can be given is a miracle. But Loyal, I don't find that as great a miracle as the actual history of his life. And he said this. He wrote this. Either Jesus was who he said he was or he was the greatest faker or charlatan who ever lived. But would a liar and a faker suffer the death he did when all he had to do to save himself was admit he'd been lying? The miracle is that a young man of 30 years without credentials as a scholar or priest began preaching on street corners. He owned nothing but the clothes on his back and he didn't travel beyond a circle less than 100 miles across. He did this for only three years and then was executed as a common criminal. And then he wrote this. But, for 2,000 years, he has 
had more impact on the world than all the teachers, scientists, emperors, generals, and admirals who ever lived all put together. The Apostle John said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That love will not end with the end of this life. We've been promised this is only a part of life and that a greater life, a greater glory awaits us. It awaits you together one day and all that is required is that, listen to this, you believe and tell God you put yourself in his hands. I would actually add to that, repent and believe the gospel. Ronald Reagan wrote this. And believing this application strongly today, I've done this myself. I've written to my unsaved cousins and loved ones who are steeped in Catholicism. Why? Because the power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Why handwrite your letters? Because I know they'll read it. They might not like you as a relative, but they like reading things that are written down with your penmanship. And ladies and gentlemen, this is just one application on getting active and more active in advancing the kingdom of God. There's many, many things. You can pray. Amen? Very crucial, very effective. You can invest your worldly wealth to the cause of Christ. Very needed, very effective. Our missionaries could use thousands of dollars right now in their respective areas, respective ministries, respective places. You can take a younger man. Ladies, you can take a younger woman. Take them under your wing with your godly influence and disciple them in Christ. You might ask, what does that mean to disciple somebody in Christ? Well, basically, just to talk to them about your life in Christ. To talk to them about Christ. Tell them how you became a Christian in the first place. Tell them about how you started to be a believer in Jesus and how you've grown in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ. That's what discipleship is. And you can utilize our discipleship center, which we, we have many, many resources and tools for helping young believers in this Christian life. Thirdly and lastly, this last application is for unbelievers. From today's text, Jesus announced his sudden and unexpected return. Sudden, unexpected return. You're not guaranteed of tomorrow. It will be too late to respond to God then when you see the second coming of Christ and therefore you must prepare now. How do I do that? Repent and believe the gospel. Be convicted of your sins. Go to God and on the basis of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, He can forgive you of your sins. Confess to God your sins. He is just and faithful to forgive you of your sins because of Jesus' first coming. He suffered 
and died for the sins of those who would receive him. He died as a substitute for all of those who would believe in him. In our outreach yesterday, little CJ and I met a man in his late 50s. He was washing his car. He's got his Tesla there. He's got his Toyota Camry. And he was diligently just scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing. Introduced myself and we invited him to Riverside Baptist Church. And to make a long story short, we ended up just reading the gospel outline to him. The gospel outline. God is a holy God. And that is a problem. Why? Because you are not holy. But God, in his mercy and patience, God, in his love, you think about this. The Bible tells us that God is a righteous just, and he is angry at the wicked every day. But what is keeping him from giving the judgment today? It's his love. It's his grace. It's his patience. It's his mercy. And so I told him, here's the good news. Jesus died for the sins of those who would believe in him. On the basis of his death on the cross, you can go to God and ask for forgiveness. Here's Jesus. He is the Savior he is the only one to whom you can go to Christ, to whom you can go to God, to whom you can go and enter the kingdom of God. It is Him and Him alone through whom alone Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. His wife peeked out of the house and said something in Spanish. I thought it was something like, go back to work. <laughs> he said back something like, just a minute, I want to hear. And so I proceeded to tell him, you're not guaranteed of tomorrow. You must call on Christ now. Repent of your sins and believe the gospel. Perhaps you're like that today. Now is the time. Now is the accepted time to go to God. Believe his first coming. Believe his second coming. Would you do that? I can't, I can't say it for you. I can't pray it for you. It's between you and God. God, save me. Because I don't want judgment on the second coming. I want salvation. Salvation from my sins. Salvation from the judgment that is to come. Call upon the name of the Lord. And his promise is, you shall be saved.